are listening to Deeply Curious, a podcast about our ever-evolving philosophy of life and faith and the curious pursuit of knowledge and wisdom. In this episode, we are talking about the concept of play. My name is Cody Jensen, and joining me, as always, is the girl who gives me the nickname Co-Delicious. Mm-mm. More please, my wife, is, Sarah Jensen. Is that what I say? <laughs> Deeply Curious and all the art that we create is made possible by you and the members of Jensen AV Club. This week's show is produced by Christian B. Schmidt, Joel Kai Linz, Amber Day, Greg and Christy Jensen, and Jeff Stevens. If you'd like to be a future producer of Deeply Curious, um, just go and check out the Jensen AV Club. It's our Patreon. You can do that by going to jensenav.club. Jensenav.club. <laughs> So <laughs> infomercial voice. Yes. <laughs> um, so for this week, we are going to talk about the concept of play and essentially regaining play as an adult and how scary that can be. Right. Um, before we jump into that conversation, we have started a semi-regular statement. Uh, no, not statement. A semi-regular segment. segment of things we have learned this week. Yes. And what have you learned this week? Well... I read this book by Rob Sheffield and anybody who I've had a personal conversation with in the last several months has heard me talk about Rob Sheffield. Um, He is a writer for Rolling Stone and he is absolutely brilliant. And this is my third book that I've read of his called Dreaming the Beatles. And it's all about the Beatles and why. Who? Who who are they? Yeah, it's just this band, you know. Um, Why... They, you know, came about in the 60s and then broke up less than 10 years after they formed, but just keep getting more everything, like bigger, um, more generations keep discovering them and they're still like the top of the game and nobody really understands what's happening. And uh, the tagline of the book is the love story between one band and the whole world which i think is just a really good summation of what the book is actually about like it is truly just like a love story of the band and the whole world and why we still love them so much so it's a phenomenal book highly recommend came out a couple years ago but i was reading it and there is this uh paragraph about a um interview where an interviewer asked paul mccartney um a question and it said paul is asked what he'll do when the bubble bursts you know like beatlemania and all of that stuff um in 1964 he explains he and john will write songs for other artists though quote who knows at 40 we might not know how to write songs anymore it's touching for a number of reasons 40 was the age when john was killed shortly after writing ringo a song called life begins at 40 but mainly for the way Paul predicts he and John will outlast the Beatles as a team. When they're done performing, he and John will hover behind the scenes, giving their music away to younger people. In so many ways, this is exactly what happened. Which I thought was just like a really beautiful paragraph, but also to learn the history that he said, we may not know how to write songs at 40, and then 40 is when John was killed just after he wrote a song for Ringo called Life Begins at 40 is, it kind of blew my mind. (laughs) And uh, again, anybody I've had a personal conversation with in the last week Mm -hmm. has heard me say that. Yeah, including me. uh, This is probably the fourth time I've heard that. Yes. uh, Because I was there for some of those conversations. I can't (laughs) stop thinking about the, it's it's so wild. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. And everybody should learn, I mean, it's the Beatles, mm-hmm. you know? Like what What about that specifically is the thing that, that makes you so passionate about it? Is it the serendipitous like moment of like the, the death being timed at the same time as the song or mm-hmm. like, like- Yes, I mean, I definitely think it's serendipitous in a- Sad way. A heartbreaking way, yeah. which I think is probably like what gets me. But even, even more serendipitous is that he wrote a song called Life Begins at 40. Mm-hmm. And then was killed a few weeks later at 40. Mm -hmm. Like that, it blows my mind. 
Right, which is on. I mean, that in itself is obviously the heartbreaking thing. Is not right. It's like obviously it's heartbreaking just because somebody died. But then the fact that he at that point in his life believed that his life had truly begun. Well, like, maybe he yeah. turned forty, and he believed like my life, life has begun life now. Begins like, at forty, and then he only got to live it for a few months. Yeah, I just think that is a piece of. Beatle history that's actually more important than a lot of the history that we know. And I feel like it's probably history that nobody knows. Hmm. You know what I mean? I guess details are important. Yeah. That's, that's my point. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what I learned. And it, it has, kind of blew my mind. <laughs> has been consuming you. Yeah. Um, so for me, I've learned a lot of things. But the thing that I wanted to share was out of my... Um, morning reading book i'm reading uh, life without lack from dallas willard and it is very much on um like living a deeply like spiritual life um the title living without lack is um living without is living con in contentment mm -hmm. um and how that is lived out through the teachings of jesus but the part of the the book that i wanted to that i really thought was interesting that like I, I was I was reading and I was like oh wow I've never heard it put that way is a really great argument for the fact that we have free will oh. because there are multiple because there's conversations that we don't have free will right, right? because there are multiple um, like different uh, schools of philosophy and uh, some of those schools of basically you could break down um, if you wanted to uh, break down all states of, of philosophy into, you know, there's this side and then that side. Um, one of the things that you could do is say philosophy is that believe that we have a free will and then philosophy is the belief that we do not have a free will. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know which one, you know, would have more on each side. But the point is, I've well, been I think probably my guess would be that we do have free will mm -hmm. because none of us want to believe that, right. <laughs> that we're being controlled. Right. But I've been I've been hearing more and more in recent years of like thoughts of that we do not have a free will. Right. That the actions that we take are um, actually as, as we basically tell ourselves stories to make ourselves believe right. that we made a choice of our own free will. But we don't actually know that. Because there are every single circumstance in your life, every single experience in your life, and all of the cultural thoughts that you were brought up in all culminate to you making that decision. Right. So wasn't it an actually a decision of free will or was it a decision made for you by your um, environment? Right. Um, or if you want to take um, – there are uh, that that would be like a philosophical argument for you that you don't have free will, but then there is also theological schools that believe in in predestination and basically that every person right. is predestined to make certain decisions and to um, you know end up in a certain place. And you know those are all interesting thought experience experiments to me and in, in thinking about and hearing these you know uh, neuro basically neuroscientists or you know whatever title that they give themselves talking about that they don't actually think that we have a free will right. is an interesting thought. But I had never heard a like really, really good um, counter argument mm -hmm. for the fact that we do have free will. And I, I read this, the, there's this, uh, um, it, it's almost a full page in this book, but it just breaks down like a very simplistic argument that we do have free will mm -hmm. um, that I wanted to share. But before we do that, do you, what do you think? Do we have free will? Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. I'm inclined to think that we do. But again, I don't want to believe that I don't. Mm -hmm. So I don't really know. But I I will say that I definitely subscribe to the idea that we make decisions based on the environment and culture in which we grew up in. Mm -hmm. That I mean, I don't doubt that at all. So I think it's pretty evident that like, you know, America – values individualism which will make decisions right. for you mm -hmm. versus you know doing something that's best for the family or whatever right. like i mean that i fully subscribe to that idea but i don't know if that's like f free will or not i don't know mm -hmm. i guess <laughs> yeah so 
Um, I'm going to have Sarah read this because she is a much better reader um, than I am. And I think we will all be able to comprehend better um, if Sarah reads it. <laughs> okay. While you know that you are visible to others, you also know that part of you is invisible. It is in your thoughts and feelings, your mind, and above all, in your ability to choose your will. You can direct your actions, make plans, and carry them out. This is a function of the invisible part of you. You know by experience that your will is the source of the visible things that come to be as a result of your choices. How do you know? By simply observing yourself. That you are reading these words now is a clear example. Earlier in the day, maybe only 20 minutes ago, the invisible part of you, your will, decided to read this book. That decision led to the visible actions of picking up the book, turning to a particular page, and to the further actions of reading, turning more pages, and maybe even taking notes. All visible things. Why did it all happen? I doubt it is because someone picked you up and threw you into a chair and forced you to read. No, you are reading this book now because the invisible side of you decided to do so, directed your body to, the, to do the necessary things, and now here you are, reading. The important point here is that you have in yourself the Romans 120 experience of the invisible originating the visible. That is why when you look around at the things that are visible, you can know two things they share in common. First, they came into existence and sooner or later will pass out of existence. Second, each of them was created from an invisible source. Again, you know this from your own experience and you confirm it in others who have the same experience. If I had to pull all this together in one phrase, I would say it is the experience of free will. By making you in his image, God has given you in your will the power of originative action, the power to create and to bring things into existence. So first question would be, what does that make you think of? I mean, that makes a lot of sense. I think there's definitely like two of us. Mm -hmm. Like there are, we have multiple selves, mm -hmm. all of us, which I know some people might disagree with or feel like that sounds scary or whatever, mm -hmm. but we have multiple selves. There is a conscious and a subconscious right. that is making decisions for sure. I absolutely yeah. believe that. Yeah. And I, I think that that, um, like, as I was thinking about that, of like these mics that we are talking into, um, like they started from the invisible. There was a person who right. in their invisible being created this microphone and then brought it into physical existence by bringing together the elements of the earth into this microphone. Right. But it all started from an invisible source and became visible. Mm -hmm. And that, that visible became tangible and it became material. And that material thing is this microphone, but this material thing does not last forever. It will eventually disintegrate and become back part of the elements of the earth. Um, but the invisible will be eternal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Which I think is a, a good argument for free will. Yeah, it's just a fascinating argument for free will. Um, and I think if you like were to, you obviously, you the listener, um, did not choose to pick up that book and read that passage. But if you replaced a book with listen to this podcast, Right. It would be the same. Right. Like there's something inside of you that chose to push the button on this podcast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Which I don't know, just seemed really interesting. Um, yeah. For that argument, which I guess you could still have the counter argument of like, but did picking up the book itself, was that a choice of free will or did you give yourself a story of like, Choosing right. it, you know, I feel like you could kind of keep going down a rabbit hole of a rabbit hole of a rabbit hole. I mean, it's just going to cycle back around. Right. But I choose to believe and I, I think that that, you know, basically swayed my uh, thought in. I, mean, I, I kind of always thought we had free will, but I, I was interested in the argument. Yeah. But I think that gave me such a personally that gave me such a strong counter argument that that is ultimately what I believe would, yeah. would be that we do have free will and the Nate and the evidence of that is the fact that our invisible selves manifest itself into the visible. Yes. Yeah. I think that's a good argument. So those are the things that, uh, we learned, um, this week and then now a little more philosophical than mine, but <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so the thing that we wanted to talk about is the nature or the concept of play. Um, so what I say, when I say play, to get us all in the same definition, whenever I say the word play, I mean a fully um, vulnerable um, state of being that you are no longer in fear of the uh, opinions of others and you are fully within and without yourself engaging in something that is life-giving. And the example that we can have of that is children going to play. You like, hey, go mm -hmm. play. Mm -hmm. And they sit there with you know blocks or they go run outside. They have a stick. They have a cardboard box. And they fully, they are fully in play that right. there is... They have no fear of people seeing them in that state. They have no like conscious thought of like, this is ridiculous, this isn't real, um, anything like that. They are they are have that childlike faith of being one with themselves and in play. Mm -hmm. And the reason that it's so fascinating to me and interesting to me is because I do not believe that that is just for childhood. Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't think so either. Obviously, we all lose it because of the society and, you know, what I guess is required to, quote, unquote, be an adult. But also, I think it does change and morph over time. Like, you know, adults aren't, like, sitting in boxes pretending like it's a rocket ship. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, that's not something... I mean, I guess it's something you could do, right? honestly, but I don't, I think that play will inevitably morph as you change. Mm -hmm. So maybe, I guess that's just, I don't know, a yeah. thought. <laughs> yeah, I have, I have like two different streams of thought whenever it comes to this. One um, would be just the importance of getting there. Right. Um, because I, I oh, man, it is just so life-giving and energizing and like it makes you it's essentially like a humbling experience of like centering yourself back into that we of what life is like it's not right. just these uh repetitive um tasks that we have to do day in and day out to survive like life is enjoyment like to mm -hmm. live life is to enjoy it and if you were to enjoy your like pieces of your life to the point of feeling as though you are outside of yourself or looking at it that you are fully inside yourself without external pressures of not being able to live that out, mm -hmm. that is being at play. And I think as adults, um, I, let's kind of give some examples of the way that I think that most adults experience play. Okay. Um, so for me, I think that whenever I say, you know, I'm, I'm, whenever I notice myself that I am like living it, I am fully in play, would be things like um, skiing. Mm -hmm. um, whenever I am uh, skiing on a mountain and like it's just me just flying through trees and like doing that type of thing, I feel like, free mm -hmm. like it's just that moment of like enjoying everything that is happening like everything about this is play and enjoyment and just like letting go like fully letting go of everything is like me right like skiing well i would say for you it's almost just anything that in uh brings like adrenaline mm -hmm. because it's also i mean because of the way that you grew up like you were very active in a water park, et cetera. Um, I think like skiing and even um, boosted boarding. Yes. And like boosted boarding, like so the boosted board is an electric skateboard that goes 20 miles an hour. Um, whenever I do that through the streets of a city, like with traffic, through traffic, just like flying by with like essentially just a helmet and the, all the rest of me is exposed to the yeah. elements and I'm doing that. I feel, I mean, free would be the, like. Yeah. I think for you, 
there's definitely a sense of like uh <laughs> close to death right makes you more alive right the closer i feel i am to dying the more i feel alive which is i mean there's that there's science for that that makes sense yeah. to a degree but, but to, yeah, yeah. but because even i'm not like, an adrenaline junkie where like i have to go hang off the side of buildings in order to feel alive it's just right. certain it but there, skydiving there, there's a, there's is a this, line for me yeah but skydiving is the same way for you yes like i would skydive every week if i could yeah exactly you're very much a prefer the adrenaline kind of stuff. Or like just the like fast moving. Mm -hmm. I don't really know what you call it, but whatever that is. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what your thing is for sure. Yeah, that is one of the things. Yeah. Yeah. The, the thing that I think that in my in my adult like brain, the thing, the socially acceptable things. Mm -hmm. So that would be the other side of my argument that we'll get to. But okay. the socially acceptable ways of play for me mm -hmm. would be those that I feel like are something that I need to make sure are part of a general schedule of regularity in mm -hmm. my life. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I can't go skydive all the time, but I can take my electric skateboard down the street. For sure. Like, so I can, I can get elements of it, you know, um, throughout as, as much as I want, really. Yeah. Um, what, what, when do you feel that you are in a socially acceptable way of play? Um, definitely concerts, I think is the main one. Mm -hmm. Just like, well, not every concert because it has to be a concert that I am really into. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but, Concert, maybe like halfway through, and then you're just like dancing and forget that anybody else is in the room, even mm -hmm. though you're like right in the middle of everyone and it's kind of annoying sometimes, is probably it. Mm -hmm. What do you, like, if you could f put into words how you feel, like... Free. It is the the moment like about halfway through a concert when you're dancing and you forget that other people can see you mm -hmm. and you're finally not in your own head. I personally think that as humans, we need those moments mm -hmm. way more regularly well, than Well, you know we what I think is an interesting thing to think about, like, as your own person. Whenever you are somewhere and you see someone just dancing mm -hmm. or just like doing something silly, you mm -hmm. know, do any of us look at them and go, oh, what an idiot? Mm -hmm. No, all of us smile and are like, good for them. Mm -hmm. You know, like, oh, they're being their own person. They don't even care who's around and this is fun. They're just having fun. When you see someone having fun, you all of a sudden feel happier. Mm-hmm. And that's, I mean. And I, th I would say that sometimes it's even a bit of jealousy. Oh, there's definitely a bit of jealousy, but a jealousy in a a way that you're like, oh yeah, I want that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's not like, ugh. Mm -hmm. It's not, I don't know. I would call it something different than jealous. Jealous has a negative connotation, I guess. And this isn't really negative. You, you more like, you kind of yearn for it. Right. And like, I don't know. I just, and then apply that to your own life. Mm -hmm. And we're all so scared that like people are watching us, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. So we don't dance around. We don't like tap our foot to the music while we're waiting in line or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Like nobody cares. Mm -hmm. Everybody's actually smiles when they see the people who do that, which I think is something that we should all remember. Right. And that, that is like the core of the conversation. I believe that we, that I'm getting to, um, but that second facet of play of that there is the socially acceptable ways of play. Right. Um, You're in an environment that is conducive for that. It makes sense. Right. Like all the extreme sports, you know, stuff that I'm talking about, like nobody's like looking at that being like, oh, grow up. Like right. well, some like curmudgeons are, but like right. in general, though, like it's kind of like, oh, man, I wish I could do that. Um, and then there's like concerts, you know, fully like dancing your heart out at a concert. Right. Even if it, even if you're a terrible dancer, nobody cares because nobody's looking at you. Also, nobody cares because actually nobody literally cares. Right. Um, and there's so, a there's a quote from David Foster Wallace that he said, "People will stop caring about how much people 
or what people think about them when they realize how seldom they do, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which is really just the truest thing that's ever been said. (laughs) Right. And so just like there are all these socially acceptable ways, but then I feel as though even more, I'm fascinated by the idea of why we can't engage in play almost constantly um, because of the seemingly socially unacceptable ways of play. Mm-hmm. And so uh, uh, the reason, one of the things that made me think about this was we were in Oklahoma for uh, the holidays and um, Sarah and I have um, nieces and nephews now. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was just sitting there and I was um, playing with like blocks or something with my nephew and I was fully able to get into play with him Mm -hmm. and like to basically, I mean, I don't know, like, but I would assume like to his level where we are in an imaginative state, creating a world and like Right, you joined in on his story that he was telling. Right, and And he's like telling a story and I'm joining in and like it's kind of like an improv thing where like everything's yes, like, okay, that's happening and now we're, you know, doing Mm -hmm. this thing and like just being fully enraptured in play in a way that the all the rest of the adults adults in the room are incapable of reaching at this point in their life. Mm-hmm. That's evident by some of the more like lighthearted, like teasing comments that would be made like about me doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then just me thinking like, but why? Mm-hmm. Like, why is it something that should be teased instead of something that should be longed for or something that should just happen? Like, why as adults can we not do that? um freely Mm -hmm. and then like what you mentioned earlier of like sitting in a cardboard box and like acting like you're you know an astronaut or something like while that sounds super silly i mean you're right what is is there anything wrong with that and also why can't we do that it kind of goes back to what i was saying about how i do believe we make decisions based on the environment and culture in which we grow up. And mm-hmm. I, and you know, there's also those um, uh, studies, I guess, or whatever, about how fear is learned. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you watch a baby, like they did the thing where they put the parents on the other side of the room and it was like a completely glass floor that was like w- heights that was mm-hmm. the thing, you know? Mm-hmm. And babies just like crawled across it without another thought, you know, they just did it. And then they brought them back like however many years, five years or whatever later. And then like a lot of them were scared to walk across it, you know? And mm-hmm. so the, the idea is that maybe like fear is learned. Mm-hmm. And so I think that prob- that applies here it has to, mm-hmm. that we are taught in some way, subconsciously or not, I don't know, mm-hmm. <laughs> somehow we're taught that, play is wrong right i I mean it's why you can't be a serious musician Mm -hmm. and make money doing art and you know whatever like there's so many conversations in culture that i mean everybody the minute they get a job they give up their passion Mm -hmm. you know i mean that's just the truth like it's taught right and uh, the thing that, th- th- that that fear makes me think about too is with all those socially unacceptable, like in our in our cultural context, socially unacceptable ways of play, and the reason that we feel so so much anxiety mm-hmm. about engaging in those types of play, and the reason that people, um, you know, maybe tease or you know, and some people like legitimately are hateful yeah. about people enjoying things is because of their own learned experience of people making fun of them for doing things that they thought, you know, that they were fully enjoying, which leads to the fact that I think that to be fully at play Mm -hmm. is a direct synonym for to be, to being completely vulnerable Mm -hmm. and is also to in being completely vulnerable in enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. And I think that enthusiasm is the scariest place that you can be emotionally. Yeah. I mean, I would definitely say, obviously, okay, well, first I'll just say my sentence. (laughs) I'm doing the thing in my, where I Mm -hmm. have a lot of opinions in my head. First, I think enthusiasm might be, enthusiasm or joy or happiness or whatever you want to call it, might be the most vulnerable 
emotion there is. Mm-hmm. Um, I say that understanding that for some people, it's very hard to be sad, vulnerable. And so, and it's not hard for me. So, you know, just a little caveat that mm-hmm. I might be a little biased. I'm not sure because I'm much better at being sad than I am at being happy. So I don't, you know, maybe that's just my opinion. I'm not mm-hmm. sure. But I do think that it might be the most vulnerable because in that moment of like pure just elation, you are you. Mm-hmm. Like there's there's no more guard. Mm-hmm. There's, you know, there's there's nothing like you you are you and if somebody rejects that that is terrifying i mean it's absolutely terrifying Mm -hmm. if somebody rejects your silly dancing they are rejecting you Mm -hmm. because whenever you reach a state of play like whenever like that's why i started with my definition of play because it is that yeah whenever you reach a state of complete freedom in play that means that you are free of guard. Yeah. You are at you're a very vulnerable state because you are free of all of your defense mechanisms that you op- that that you have to operate in a daily society. Right. And so whenever all of those vul- when you when you're in that vulnerable state with all of those guards being down, like Sarah just said, that is you. Mm-hmm. At the like that is who you are in your essence at your core. That is you operating freely in the enjoyment of life and being who you are in its in your fullest. Mm-hmm. And if you present that to the world and the world says, nah. sit down and shut up and grow up, mm-hmm. then you're like, like you feel as though you, you start to question all of reality. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I really do think that it might be the most vulnerable emotion. Um. I, I mean, and I think that it's probably evident in the fact that all of us give it up. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're not good at vulnerability. <laughs> right. As human beings. It's it's the thing that most people can't do. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's uh, it must be true for the, you know, most tragic emotions and the most happy emotions Mm -hmm. has got to be at least equal vulnerability if not more so because i do think like we are made to be like we are made to celebrate life like we are made to enjoy what's on this earth right like i i just think that that's that's the truth like regardless of belief systems or whatever like you're not here to suffer and have a terrible time. Everyone Mm -hmm. can agree on that, right? Mm -hmm. So I do, I think maybe the happiest feelings are the most vulnerable. Yeah. Because that's why we're here. Yeah. That's why we exist. And I think that because there is so much suffering in the world, Mm -hmm. there are so many people, all of us are in pain, and but there are so many people that have been hurt and have not been able to make it through their hurt yet. Right. That to they have to cut other people down mm-hmm. who are in a state of enjoyment um, in order to make themselves feel better, which leads to the cultural phenomenon that we find ourselves in now of an entire generation of people who hide every sense of enthusiasm behind irony. Yeah. And that anytime we are in enjoyment that we feel like, oh oh yeah, we're enjoying this thing. We do it with a state of irony. um, So as that, if somebody was to make fun of us, we'd be like, oh yeah, I mean, I was just being ironic. Right. So let me give you an example of that. I love to dance. Uh, Like whenever I am at my essence, whenever I am completely free of all of the cultural like walls that I have in place, I dance. Mm -hmm. I love to dance. I, it it is energizing to me. It is freeing to me. It is like being one, like my, it clears my head out and I am one with my mind and body. Like it is something I very much enjoy to do. But I find that in certain, if, if not all, Mm -hmm. um, social context, because I don't actually know how to dance. Like I'm not a, 
I'm not a trained dancer. Like I don't know how to dance. I just know that I like to dance. Um, so whenever I'm in a social context, like a concert or a wedding or, you know, whatever it may be, instead of just dancing, losing myself in my head and dancing free and complete, I dance with a bit of silliness and a bit of like, like I'm dancing. Oh my gosh. But look, I'm kind of doing something funny right now. Like, you right. know, be because that way, if I dance poorly and somebody points at me and laughs because I'm dancing poorly, then it's, it's, I have this, I'm, I'm still carrying a mask. There's still a wall. Uh, there's still a wall that I can point to and be like, yeah, but it's just silly. Like I'm just being silly mm -hmm. um, and doing this silly thing. And then we're like, you know, I can make you like laugh and enjoy and, you know, and join in in that like kind of. Right. Like we both agree right now that I'm doing something silly, mm -hmm. not that I'm doing something that is embarrassing. embarrassing. Right. And that is something that I just recently like learned um, because I was feeling so much anxiety at a concert of like letting myself go and like feeling like I have to dance more silly instead of dancing like free mm -hmm. and realizing it's like the, 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 the anxiety was caused by my fear of others seeing me in my self mm -hmm. and that I had to hide my enjoyment of dancing behind a wall of irony. Right. And I think that that is a prime example of the way we, all of us, especially the millennial generation just hide everything that we truly enjoy behind an air of silliness or an yeah. air of like, we're both aware that this isn't like, you know, I know fully this isn't me. cool. So just FYI, I know this isn't <laughs> right. Yeah. And so like, I think that I feel like that's an illustrative point to that we as humans don't allow ourselves to, enjoy life and fully get into a state of play and how important a being in play is, but how difficult being in play is and how to be in play, you have to be vulnerable and you have to be enthusiastic and enthusiasm may be one of the most scariest places to get. Mm -hmm. And also possibly, I don't know, one of the like most scrutinized thing by others, mm -hmm. which enforces the fear. Right. Which then begs the question of, how are we supposed to enjoy life if we care about the opinions of others? <laughs> it all comes back around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think you don't, honestly. I mean, I think if you're truly honest with yourself, anytime you're caring about what other people are thinking, you are not having fun. Mm -hmm. You are not in a good mental state. You're not creating the best work you can create. You're not, I mean, you're creating more anxiety. You're, it's all negative stuff mm -hmm. that happens when you're worrying about the opinions of others. And I think it's showcased when you, ha you have work that comes out where they're like, oh yeah, I was being safe because I felt like I had to, you know, whatever. And then the next one they're like, yes, screw all of that. I'm just going to do whatever I want. And how much better is that work of art mm -hmm. or whatever, you know, like so much better mm -hmm. because the truth is that the opinions of others only hold you back. Let's say um, a recent example of art that was clearly made better by somebody letting go. Harry Styles' new album, Fine Line, I think is a brilliant example of that um which if you have not heard oh my gosh like, i was gonna not pause. be a fangirl about it but no, we oh have to be. my gosh <laughs> we have to be it's the i mean it has to be the album of the year I, I think so i think canyon moon is my favorite song that came out in 2019 100 mm percent. -hmm. yeah harry styles album fine line is one of the most artful yeah. Vulnerable, joyful, fun, fun, makes it heartbreaking. It makes me cry every single time I listen to the the song "Fine Line." Every every single time I listen to it, I cry. Every song, every single time I hear um, "Treat People with Kindness" or "Canyon Moon" or um, "Watermelon Sugar," mm -hmm. I dance, and I, it's just it's so good. 
so good. There's not actually a word for how good it is. <laughs> yeah. And th- so that is our um, infomercial for why you should pause this podcast. Go listen to the Oh, yeah. Album. Quit listening to us. Yeah. Go listen to his beautiful yeah. voice. Okay. Um, but that is an illustrative point to the fact of his first album was also very good. Which I, I very much enjoyed his first album. But it was his debut album. And you could tell that in that album... He was As he nervous, yeah, maybe was is nervous, word. yeah, or something like holding back. He was holding his true self back, and you could. It's he still was able to make very good, fun art, yeah. But the depth but and even, vulnerability yeah. and like trueness, like the universal truth of emotion and feeling that is in the second album, comes out because he was able to shed that fear mm-hmm. of. The industry or the, of the is, opinions and truly yeah. make the art that he wanted to make. Yeah, which honestly, I guess, goes kind of goes into the question I've been thinking about for several weeks now is just like, why are we ashamed of being human? Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, we are human. We experience a myriad of emotions. <laughs> We, and I just find it fascinating that we would want to pretend like that's not the case. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, Harry Styles' album, every single emotion is on that album. You know, kind of self-pity, even just like painful honesty about himself, joy, heartbreak like everything every mm-hmm. emotion is on that album and so and because we are human and i just i find it fascinating that we are all so ashamed to be walking around as a human being yeah so by that you mean ashamed of our faults yeah ashamed of what we've been told is a fault hmm. i guess what i'm saying is that i think maybe there are no faults because we're human now that's not to say that is too general of a statement. I understand there's like emotional maturity and making healthy decisions and mm-hmm. learning how to grow up in a good way and right. you know whatever. I I'm not discounting any of that, but I think maybe there are no faults because we're human. Mm-hmm. It's not that we're we are incapable of not making faults. Right, but I think like maybe. We're all very beautiful creatures. Mm-hmm. So I don't know why we're all walking around ashamed of that. Mm-hmm. Which, ashamed of feeling things, I guess is what I'm saying. Right. Why, like, every single person feels jealousy and self-pity. Why are we pretending like we don't? Mm-hmm. Not that you should indulge those necessarily. Right, but, or wallow. Oh, yeah, but, but why pretend like it's not the truth? Mm-hmm. Why pretend like we don't love dancing like an idiot? <laughs> we <Right>. all do. <laughs> so why pretend like we don't? Yeah. I mean, I think that it's it's all protection. I mean. Well, I know it is. I know that like. My your, why is your more question, rhetorical. Yeah, your, your question is more of a rhetorical thing. Um, but to answer it, uh, my opinion would be that it is because of our ego um, and by ego, I mean our egoic state of mind, not like being egotistical, but just like each and every one of us like has- the mask we wear. It has an ego. And that ego is the mask, the personality, the um, thing that we use to present ourselves to the everyday world. Um, and that state, that egoic layer um, is what we choose. That's what we use to protect ourselves from pain, and mostly pain. Yeah. Um, but there is all sorts of different types of pain. And I think that we don't allow ourselves to be vulnerable is what you were talking about is just why don't we allow ourselves to feel all the all the things and admit that everybody feels all the things because to admit a fault is very vulnerable. Right. Um, to admit um, a to, – to admit a – it, something that you very, very much enjoy is also vulnerable because like we mentioned earlier that you are revealing who you actually are. And if somebody rejects that, then they're rejecting who you really are. So that's vulnerable. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I think that you are right. 
And I wish we could all get there because it is very evident that because we cannot see, we cannot admit that we ourselves are a complete human that has all ranges of emotions and faults and feelings uh, that that fall into the category of right or wrong, that fall into the category of health and unhealth. Mm -hmm. And we want to present to the world a version of ourselves that does not exist that where everything we do say and believe falls on the line falls on the correct side of the line right and because we want to present that ourselves in that way we mask ourselves and hold ourselves behind so many walls and those walls um present themselves as arrogance Mm -hmm. or you know fear or whatever it is um and that makes it where we can no longer empathize with somebody who feels the same or differently. And then you have two sides of people who they, I feel like I am presenting myself in a, in the, the perfect version of myself where all of my thoughts, feelings, desires, and actions fall on the correct side of the line. And if I look at somebody else who I feel like theirs are the opposite of me, that right. means that all of that they are evil, that they fall on the other side of the line, which is a line of being wrong. Mm-hmm. But the actual truth of the matter is that I have feelings, thoughts, opinions, um, and actions that fall on both sides of the line. Right. And so does the other person. And if we recognize that in ourselves, we can recognize that in others and we can accept others for them, who they truly are. And we don't have to go into a fully divisive battle of right and wrong. Right. Um. While you were talking, I thought of this quote that actually goes very well with what I'm talking about. It's from Patti Smith, which Mm. is kind of my hero. Anyway, she says, I'm going to promote promote myself exactly as I am with all my weak points and my strong ones. My weak points are that I'm self-conscious and often insecure. And my strong point is that I don't feel any shame about it. Yeah. Which I think is uh, the truth. The truth is that a strong point is that you can admit that you are weak. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That you are a human being and everything that we've been talking about. <laughs> right. A strength is, again, like I was talking about, nobody actually looks at somebody dancing silly and thinks, ugh, what an idiot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they see strength when mm-hmm. when they see that. And w- that's why we smile. Right. And to that point, also whenever to... Uh, to argue against my own self. Mm-hmm. Um, it, whenever we see someone who is dancing completely lost in dance, mm-hmm. we also look at that person with, you know, somewhat like adoration or with um, like just a smile of like, look, they're enjoying themselves. They are having a great time. Right. Like that in their enjoyment is contagious. Mm-hmm. And, it is nothing to be scared of. Right. But it is the scariest possible thing, I think. Yeah. I mean, I really do think enthusiasm might be the most vulnerable emotion. Which is saying a lot from me. <laughs> I like all the sad emotions. <laughs> yeah. That actually reminded me of another um, piece of life without lack that kind of is another like a really kind of good example of not letting ourselves be fully who we are Mm -hmm. because it because it doesn't fall in line with the cultural norm of either being negative because most of the world it it finds itself um, bonded through negativity Mm -hmm. and bonded through suffering instead of bonded through life-giving enthusiasm and so it can be very Um, hard to maintain a sense of enthusiasm about things or that are different than what culture is having enthusiasm about. Mm -hmm. Um, And in this passage, he says, if we go to work tomorrow and declare, I don't need anything, people will probably think you are weird, very weird. You are supposed to be in need. You are supposed to lack. That's one of the things that people can use to manage you. But if you go there complaining griping, groaning, and even cursing God, making it known just how much you lack, they will say, yes, they're likely to call you a really good person, the salt of the earth, because complaining is the way of the world. That's an interesting uh, statement just about 
they can control you through uh, your lack or mm-hmm. whatever. That's so true. I mean, not to get, uh, I won't get on a soapbox, but mm-hmm. the controlling through lack is exactly the materialistic world. Right. That's what I'm saying. Like everything in which we sort of operate is that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like if you if you are a person of contentment, if you are a person who lacks of nothing, and you are somebody who can walk into a place and not literally say it, but like Mm -hmm. walk into a place and not be of need and not be lacking in Mm -hmm. in like who you are, then it they hold nothing against you. They hold they can't control you. They can't sell anything to you. They there's no way that they can you know, manipulate you Mm -hmm. into being a part of something because you don't need anything. It is the manipulation of our needs that gets us into trouble. It's our manipulation of our needs that, you know, takes us down paths of becoming a person we didn't intend to become. Right. It also makes us give up play. Right. And that, that was the point is, um, that we do instead of showing up in how we truly are, mm-hmm. we show up complaining because when we show up complaining, people around us say, "Yes, you are right. You are the salt of the earth." You know, whatever, mm-hmm. whatever. Like y- you find solidarity in the complaining instead instead of holding yourself to who you actually are. Mm-hmm. Um, it, and I think there's a risk there too in that you actually become the complainer. Oh, for sure. I mean negative talk or emotions or whatever definitely just take hold and run with it Mm -hmm. i mean it is so easy to if you're if you like work in a job with with a negative environment which i did Mm -hmm. i was not a i you didn't want to be around me i like i was i was a negative person i was terrible all i could do is think about how much i hated everything Mm -hmm. because it i mean that's just the way it works Mm -hmm. and what's interesting about that is you were negative on the other side of their negativity oh yeah you were negative because you thought they were so wrong in their negativity that it actually manifested itself in you being negative in the opposite right that that like right like i was i was arguing them mm -hmm. you know their whatever but it made me kind of a hypocrite i guess like if you're Mm -hmm. like that that's what it does Mm -hmm. that's what it does yeah and i think that the the whenever you find validation whenever you like complain and then you're validated Mm -hmm. whenever you're negative and then you're validated Mm -hmm. and whenever you basically uh are not honoring and you like shit on a boss or whatever and then you're validated in that then that actually starts to mold and shape your personality and the opposite around you know around that thing is that you continue to be validated by these negative things so you just ultimately become a negative person Mm -hmm. because all of those people around you are also negative people and validate you as a person through your you know connection of negativity Mm -hmm. which like what sarah was saying can happen in the opposite way yeah i mean if you are um criticized for positivity criticized for play enthusiasm criticized for enthusiasm like the the amount i don't i mean i'm sure people realize but the amount that all of that kind of stuff the effects that that have on you psychologically is Mm -hmm. so much more than we think it is yep which is why words are freaking important Mm mm-hmm I, and I think an example of that is I don't I don't know I heard this a long time ago so there was this study of um, grade school kids who they they came in and they asked questions but one of the questions um, that they asked was are you an artist and they asked it to each um, they asked it to the kids every year um, so they started in kindergarten and then they went all the way through. Um, I don't remember if it was just through the end of grade school or in the end of high school, but the point is it was like 100% of kindergartners say mm-hmm. that they are artists. Mm-hmm. Like 99.9% of first graders say that they're artists. And then like 98.8% of, of second graders say they're artists. Right. But then it's like, it drops off and it's like third grade is like 75%. And then it keeps going down and down and down as they get older because of an artist is 
somebody that is free thinking Mm -hmm. and school is not set up for free thinkers. Right. School is set up for you to learn a um, set of knowledges to be able to memorize, to be able to test well. And to go out into the world and to have a certain kind of job, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so if your artistry is not cultivated and is actually um, criticized because Mm -hmm. your artistry is keeping you from memorization of facts for your testing, then you're eventually going to believe that that isn't who you are and and give it up and not become the artist that you actually are because I believe every single person is an artist right um you just it you either unlearn it or it gets beaten out of you or whatever happens every i i'm reading going through this thing called the artist's way um but she talks about the repressed artist and all, all of us are um but she said this thing that i thought was really fascinating that you can often tell a repressed artist because they go into the field of which they wish that they could be. So for example, like if you wish that you could be an author, you would be in book publishing or something like that. Or if you wish you were a musician, you would be a manager or something. Mm -hmm. But it's like something that's more like practical, Mm -hmm. but within that still allows you to be around the people that you wish you were, Mm -hmm. which I thought was a really fascinating idea. But it, I, the, my point was repressed artist, I think, is like a really good term for mm-hmm. that. Like we all just sort of put it on the back burner because it's not what is practical or what makes money or whatever. Right. Or the environment of which we raised did not cultivate a right. life of being, you know, artistic or whatever. Right. And it's like a lot of people might even be very well-meaning, but but the smallest things make the biggest difference. Right. You know? It's crazy. So in conclusion, one, I would just reiterate the importance of finding your play. Yes. Um, that, you know, there there are uh, countless mm-hmm. numbers of um, like socially acceptable, non-vulnerable ways of play um, that, that adults like, you know, do on the weekend. Yeah. That that in itself is very important to find that those things that right. that make you feel that way and set up a routine in order to do those things as, as often, often as, as you can. Yes. Um and then I say a challenge for all would be to I don't even know how, but to find figure out what are these things that are holding you back. Yeah. What are these things that aren't allowing you to be you at your truest essence and to dance your heart out in even though other people may not understand and may, you know, scrutinize or not or whatever, whatever fears we have against entering into a full state of being without any walls to protect ourselves? They're called limiting beliefs. Just FYI, like just Google that. And I learned about them in a book called You Are a Badass by Jen Sincero, which I did not read the whole thing, so I cannot vouch for. But what I did read, I really loved. Um, And her name is Jen Sincero. Yes. The way you said it fast. Oh, sorry. It would be hard to. Yeah. Um, But she talked about limiting beliefs. And it's 100% that's what it is (laughs) Mm -hmm. whether they're from your own self or from your environment or your parents or whoever Mm -hmm. like there are things that we have been taught consciously or subconsciously that tell us now that we can't be at play Mm -hmm. or that we can't be an artist who doesn't struggle or that we can't be whatever you know so just google that right yeah that's great so that that i i don't know the answer to yeah like i i basically i want to implore the importance of play and then also i don't know the answer to how are we get to the point where we can all be 100 percent human and fully let ourselves go and enjoy life to its utmost fullest other than on other than on a 
completely extreme individual basis. Like, right. I don't know if we will ever get there culturally, but I think that each one of us can get there. And I think that each one of us can get there through um, basically just choosing it mm -hmm. and educating ourselves, finding the correct things to read, finding the correct things to listen to, and getting to a point where you no longer are suffering from the fear of embarrassment, you know, whatever limiting beliefs you have. Right. And I think that is such an amazing, beautiful place to be that I personally have experienced. And the reason we're having this conversation is because I experienced it and want as many people as possible to be able to get it. Right. And so I think I, but I don't, there is no, but it's such there's, a new, there's yeah. no easy steps. Like, it's not like, yeah. oh yeah, if you want to get there, follow, you know, he, read this book of five easy steps to play. Right. It's like, we just have to figure out what our limiting I, beliefs are yeah. and get past it and become a emotionally healthy person in order to step into a state of fully unabashed play. Yeah. I think it starts with just, again, self-awareness, because it always starts with self-awareness. Mm -hmm. And then it starts with just unlearning a bunch of stuff. Yeah. Which is so hard to do but is honestly so worth it <laughs> because once you unlearn then you can build it back up mm -hmm. and that's where you get to losing the opinions of others and all that stuff so in um is there any sort of uh follow-up material that you would recommend for anybody wanting to learn more about themselves in how to reach play or i mean the Enneagram has been really helpful in helping me understand why I do what I do, but I I don't know that it, I, I mean, I think it's just each individual person. The thing I would suggest is just read, mm -hmm. honestly. Like pick up, um, well, like I said, the Enneagram has been very helpful for me. Um, I'm reading The Artist's Way, which is all about unlearning all of these negative things we've learned about ourselves. Um, I think... I I highly suggest reading like philosophers and poets and um, I'm super into essay books right now because I feel like they're kind of the same, they're the same idea. I, I think that just filling your mind with as much knowledge and truth as you can that is in a not so informational businessy type Mm -hmm. uh book <laughs> yeah it's not like going to the self-help section right i and... don't i don't read self-help like i i haven't read a self-help book in years jen's uh, you, you are a badass yeah <laughs> <laughs> you are a badass is i think the last book that i read that was considered like self-help and i read that four five years ago mm -hmm. i don't know um it's not that they're not helpful but they i don't know they don't okay. work for me and i think there's a lot more out there to find mm -hmm. that people don't give a chance um so that's what i would just say get interested in the poets and the philosophers yeah they'll teach you everything honestly <laughs> <laughs> all right well if you enjoy the show we'd love if you would give us a review on itunes or share a favorite episode with a friend um, you can also partner with us by joining our patreon at jensenav.com club our intro music is provided by music bed you can learn more about music beds unlimited music subscription plan at music.codyjensen.com um, sarah and i also have a youtube channel where you can check out our uh, films that published over there at youtube.com slash cody jensen and that's it for now so thanks for listening to deeply curious and we'll see you next week bye